Okay, it's gonna have to do PVC. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to read the board from the oil. Oh, sorry about that. Because my camera just broke. <laughs> um, okay. And this, I was asked to, this is apples. I was asked to bring apples. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so there's two main things I want to talk about today. Um, but before I start, are there any questions about like anything about the course in general? Or anything? No. All right. Um, so one is just the topic of law, according to Hobbes, which is good because this is legal studies in first place. <laughs> um, and uh, the other is the question of, well, I mean, it's also really about law, but it's about um, the laws of nature as divine law. What that means exactly. And it's important because, as you noticed already, the sovereign is not subject to the law of the commonwealth, but Hobbes always adds that he is subject to the divine law. So the question is, what exactly does that mean? Um, okay, but first of all, about law. So this is the Hobbes' definition of law. This is chapter 16, paragraph 2 on page 173. Um, law in general is not counsel, but command. The distinction between counsel and command is one that he already made. And I'll come back to exactly uh, what that implies about law later. But it's not counsel, but command, nor a command of any man to any man but only of him whose command is addressed to one formally obliged to obey him. Um, formerly, I believe here just means like already. Some past time first before, yeah, so already, right? Um, but only of him whose command is addressed to one formally obliged to obey him. And as for civil law, it addeth only the name of the person commanding, which is the persona qui patis, the person of the commonwealth. So, um, so a law is a command of someone addressed to someone else who's obliged to obey them. And, um, and law in the sense that we usually understand it uh, is civil law. So it's the command of the commonwealth to its subjects by means of its representatives, that is the sovereign. Um, now, so the first thing to notice about this definition of law is that it doesn't explicitly mention punishment or reward. Um, and I mean, I'm pointing that out because you see when we get to Locke, that law is defined in terms of punishment. But in Hobbes, it's the other way around. So this is chapter 28, paragraph one on page 203. And you finally get to discussing punishment. A punishment is an evil inflicted by public authority on him that hath done or omitted that which is judged by the same authority to be a transgression of the law. To the end that the will of men may thereby the better be disposed to obedience. 
So, um, so this means, um, by definition, well, it's a little bit tricky. But um, I think uh, it's a little bit ambiguous how to understand this, but I think, so there, by definition, there can't be a punishment of a penalty. It can't because um, a punishment is an evil inflicted on him that has done or omitted that which is judged by the, by the authority to be a transgression of the law. So first of all, they have to actually have done it. And second of all, it has to have actually been judged a transgression of the law. That's part of the definition of punishment. So that's going to be especially important when we get to, to, to God and talking about punishments of the divine laws because um, as Hobbes says, this is chapter one, paragraph five on page 236. Um, And though punishment be due for sin only, because by that word is understood affliction for sin, yet the right of afflicting is not always derived from men's sin, but from God's power. Right? So what he's saying there is um, God doesn't punish the innocent. Why does God not punish the innocent? Because by definition, if they're innocent, it's not a punishment. Um, right? Though punishment be due for sin only, because by that word is understand, understood affliction for sin, but does that mean God doesn't do anything bad to people who are innocent? No, God has the right to do bad things to anyone. God has unlimited right. Why? Because there's no impediment to God doing or forbearing anything. Do you have a question? Or? No, I was going to say what? He said, but God says he gets punished all the time. So it's not just one time. Right. So that's what Hobbes goes on to say, and he gives a whole interpretation of the book of Job, which is all about that issue. Right? And, you know, his interpretation of the book of Job is like the end of that book is pretty, well, not the very end, but the, the like, I don't know main conclusion of that book is pretty ambiguous, right? Like Job spends the whole book saying, I'm innocent, complaining about why God has done all these bad things to me. And at the end, and, and his, you know, and he has three friends who keep saying, like, no, you must have done something wrong. Because look, you're being punished. And at the end, God appears, like speaks out of the whirlwind and says, no, you know, Job is innocent. You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And then says all this stuff about, like, where were you when the heavens and earth were created and so forth. Right? So um, Hobbes' interpretation is God himself taketh up the matter, and having justified the affliction by arguments drawn from his power, such as this, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And the like, both approve Job's innocence and reprove the erroneous doctrine of his friends. And then he actually he has a quote from the New Testament that's supposed to show the same thing, right? So the point is, by what right does God afflict Job? By the unlimited right of nature. Um. So, uh, but it's not punishment because he's because he's innocent, <laughs> right? So, so you know, I mean, so that just goes to show, uh, like how 
careful attention you have to pay at definitions. <laughs> um, and uh, there's going to be a similar issue with respect to the sovereign. Right? The sovereign does not have the right to punish the innocent because that's a contradiction in terms. But the sovereign does have the right to do whatever in their judgment conducive to the safety of the common. So if that means doing something bad to someone who's innocent, they have a right to do that. They have a duty to do that. Um, so because I guess, you know, maybe I should have written to a lot in front of me. So because punishment isn't involved in the definition of law, whereas law is involved in the definition of punishment, um, well, actually, maybe no, 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 that's what I'm right. So, you might think that the sovereign has the right to make laws that is to issue commands, but that the sovereign doesn't have a right to punish. That is, those two things could come apart, and um, um. I think that's why like cops can say all this stuff before finally in chapter um, 18 when he's talked about punishment suddenly raises this question. Um, where does the right to punish derive from? So the puzzle is this, like usually when we ask where does the sovereign get rights, we say, well, this, you know, the sovereign is my authorized representative. So like, where does the sovereign get the right to take my stuff? Well, I authorize the sovereign to take my stuff. That is, the sovereign expresses my will that my stuff be taken away <laughs> for the good of the common. And furthermore, it's my will that the sovereign should decide what is for the good of the commonwealth and what is not. Um, but when it comes to punishment, or at least like, so I mean, um, he asks this question in general, but I think the question is really about capital punishment, imprisonment, or corporal punishment, right? Wounds, imprisonment, or death. Um, and the question is, um, uh, well, so first of all, in those cases, I didn't authorize the sovereign to do those things in the That is, I didn't lay down my right to, you know, I, remember, so remember when you make someone your agent or, um, you know, Get them to bear your person. What you're you're laying down a right. You're laying down the right to um, when they say, like, if I make someone my agent, and they say, "This is Abe's will. Uh, give me those potatoes or this money." Okay, so um, I've laid down the right to say, "Oh no, no, I didn't want this." Because I gave the agent the authority to represent my will. So, um, but if I say uh, I'm making you my agent to uh, kill me if I do X, Y, and Z, I can't lay down the right to say, no, 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 I didn't mean that. <laughs> um, and therefore, actually, Hobbes says, like, I didn't mean that, right? Like, we have to interpret my words some other way. <laughs> because I, you know, because I can't, I can't use words to say that. I can't say I'm laying down my right to defend my to defend myself against violence. That right is inalienable. 
Why? Because right, remember, again, it's because according to Haas, being killed is the worst thing that can happen. So you can't have set up any kind of impediment that would deter you from defending yourself against violence. And laying down your right means somehow setting up an impediment to doing or forbearing the thing that before you had liberty to do or forbear. So laying down my right to defend myself would be like creating somehow some kind of incentive that would make me want to not defend myself against because of the bad consequences of defending myself. But Hobbes says that doesn't make sense because there can't be anything worse than not defending yourself against violence. So, right, so I mean, that was just, I mean, I talked about all that before, I'm just reconstructing the reason these rights are inalienable. So because these rights are inalienable, I couldn't, I didn't authorize the sovereign to, um, well, that is, yeah, I didn't authorize the sovereign to kill me, uh, inflict wounds on me, or imprison me. Um, now, uh, of course, I did lay down my right to protect others from the sovereign's punishment. Um, or even to not assist the sovereign in other people's punishments, right? Because I made the sovereign my agent to, among other things, punish other people if, if, uh, uh, if that was for the good of the common. So when they say, you know, so-and-so is gonna be punished, they're expressing my will and if they need my assistance to do that, then uh, I've laid down my right to say, oh no, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. So, um, but the question is, uh, when I do assist the sovereign to punish someone else, where do I get the authority to do that? So I've given up my right to say no to it, but the person I'm going to punish hasn't authorized me to do it. Right, so this is what he means when he says in, in chapter 18, paragraph 2, on page 204. Um, but to covenant to assist the sovereign in doing hurt to another, Unless he that so covenanteth have a right to do it himself, is not to give him a right to punish him. It is manifest, therefore, that the right which the commonwealth, that is, he or they that represent it, have to punish, is not grounded on any concession or gift of the subject. Right? It's not because the person who's going to be punished has authorized this to happen. Where does the right come from? So the answer is, I mean, it's like, first of all, do you understand the puzzle? The question about this? I mean, the answer is really kind of simple from just from Hobbes' point of view. You just have to remember, so the puzzle arises because you're assuming that the right to inflict violence on someone must come from their consent. And the puzzle is, well, but they can't consent to that, <laughs> right? So, uh, so how can it have come Pardon me, Professor. Could you move the computer a little bit closer? Um, we can almost hear you. The problem is, so since my camera broke, computer is sitting on a table, which is bolted to the floor, but I could move this table to get this. Yeah. 
How is that? Actually, the other thing I could do is maybe the mic in the camera is still working. We can hear you much better. Yeah, that's actually a whole lot better. Okay, well, let's leave it at that then, if that's okay. Um, all right. Um, But in real life, everyone in the state of nature had the right to inflict whatever they wanted. Us. So it doesn't come from their consent. That is, it only seems puzzling because we're forgetting how Hobbes understands rights. But there's no problem about where we get rights. We don't have to get rights from somewhere. We naturally have all rights. Um, the only problem is how to get rid of rights. So when we formed the Commonwealth, we didn't give up the right to inflict violence on other people for our purposes. We only, we just assigned that right to the sovereign. <laughs> so, but so this means that like um, the reason I have to obey now again this doesn't necessarily apply to um, like fines or molts as Hobbes calls them right to like um, um, financial or other property punishments I, I don't think it applies at all to that actually. Because the, the sovereign definitely has, right? I have no property rights against the sovereign at all. So, um, but again, when it comes to capital punishment or wounds or imprisonment, um, my reason to obey the law is not that um, I have authorized the sovereign, sovereign to punish me, but it's just that everyone else has retained the right to punish me that they always have in the state of nature. Or, I mean, for, in the state of nature, it wasn't a punishment because to be a punishment, it has to be, uh, it has to be for a transgression of a law. And it has to be inflicted by the authority that established the law or the reason of, we read that definition in there. Um, an evil inflicted by public authority on him that hath done or omitted that which is judged by the same authority to be a transgression of the law to the end that the will of men may thereby better be disposed to obedience, right? So it has to be for transgression of a law and it has to be for the purpose of um, getting people to obey the law in the future. Um, so, like, in a state of nature, um, you know, I can command someone to do something, but uh, they're not obliged to obey me, so it's not a law. And um, I can inflict violence on them, either because they disobeyed my command or for whatever re re other reason, but that's not a punishment. Um, but so but what's happened here is like my reason to obey the law is that everyone else has um, authorized the sovereign to hurt me <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, uh, but uh, the sovereign, um, one reason the sovereign will do that is if I just if I transgress the law to try to keep other people from transgressing the law in the future. Um, 
Um, and again, I'm going into some detail on this because we'll see like different versions of this, like, you know, basically uh, trying to trying to get out of this <laughs> in the other people going forward. Um, that, you know, that really when punishment happens, it's like uh, punishment is basically a war. Right? It's like basically the Commonwealth has declared war. On. Or it's, it's the resumption of the war of all against all. Um, so, um, okay, so that's the resolution to that problem question about punishment. Now, going back to the bigger question, so since law isn't defined in terms of punishment, although punishment is defined in terms of law, um, uh, do there always have to be punishments connected with laws? So, I mean, we've explained why the sovereign can punish me, but why does a law always have to be connected to a punishment? Um, so now let me read the, one of the things Hobbes says about the difference between counsel and command, right? So counsel means advice. Um, so, and remember, Hobbes says we get confused about this because we can use the same words to give advice or to give commands. Right? I can say, don't do that, and I can mean it as a command, or I can mean it as advice. So what's the difference between command and advice? Well, um, so this is chapter 25, paragraph two on page 165 at the bottom. Command is where a man saith, do this or do not this, without expecting other reason than the will of him that says it. I don't know exactly what he means by expecting it. In this case, it clearly doesn't have it. Or he has a footnote. Expect may mean either rely on or need. Yeah, okay, so without relying on, without needing other reason than the will of him that says it. From this it followeth manifestly that he that commandeth pretendeth thereby his own benefit. For the reason of his command is his own will only. And the proper object of every man's will is some good to himself. Right, so if I say do this, and you say why, and I say because I said so, <laughs> meaning you should do it because it's my will that you do it. Um, so first of all, Hobbes says that's what makes it a command rather than advice, right? Because if I say do this, and you say why, and I say well because it will be better for you to do this because blah 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 then that's advice. But if I say, because it is my will that you do it, then it's a command. Um, so, but since I'm saying that my will is the reason, remember Hobbes says that the will is the final, um, is, is the end of the deliberation, the final desire or aversion at the end of the deliberation. So it's always aimed at some good or some evil or the person whose will it is, right? It's like, if it's my will, then it ends with my desire or aversion. So 
So my will is always for some benefit to me. So if the reason for you to do this is because it's my will, that means the reason for you to do it is because of, because it will, it will um, give some benefit to me. <laughs> Um, so, uh, of course, you know, the question is then, well, why should I obey that? Why should I ever obey a command? Right? I mean, it seems like, according to Hobbes, I wouldn't obey a command. Or at least if I did, it would be kind of by accident. Right, because the command says do this, you know, so I say do this because it will be a benefit to me. But whatever you do, you're going to do because you think it's a benefit to you. So you can't be doing it because of my command. It would seem. So part of the answer is. Um, Suppose I, the person who issues the command is my agent and issues the command in my name. Right, so um, uh, in this case, they say, do this because it's your will. Um, right, so when the sovereign bears the person of the common law, the sovereign is speaking as the agent of all the subjects. So the sovereign is expressing their will and saying, do this because um, uh, I'm saying it's for your benefit. <laughs> now, um, um, Now, I mean, of course, as Hobbes acknowledges, the sovereign also always bears their own natural person too. That is, if it's a monarch, the monarch bears their own individual natural person. If it's an assembly, then each member of the assembly bears their own natural person. Um, Rousseau is gonna introduce another consideration, which I'm not sure Hobbes takes into account or not. But that an assembly, at least if it's an aristocracy and it's an, so it's an assembly of some, then there also may be an interest of the assembly against the interest of the whole people. But anyway, so there's at least two persons that are being, the, the sovereign always bears at least two persons. And, um, The sovereign isn't going to issue a command that uh, isn't for the benefit of their natural person. Um, so, um, so that you know. The question of uh, in what sense is it true that the sovereign is issuing a command in my name has to do with the question of like in what sense is it true the sovereign has a duty to consider the um, interest of the commonwealth when doing so and you know having a duty that is not having the right to do otherwise, that is there being an artificial impediment <laughs> to doing otherwise, that is fearing some kind of consequences if you do other, otherwise, that's what's gonna make, if anything, makes the sovereign's natural person line up with the person that's of the commonwealth they're supposed to be bearing, right? So, and that has to do with this part, if we can find an answer anywhere. Right, that is the sovereign is going to um, 
in the sovereign of an individual or as the members, the individual members of an assembly is gonna to want to give commands that actually represent the will of all the subjects. Only to the extent that they fear there will be bad consequences and that will have to be due to the law of nature and not to the civil um, otherwise. So, but leaving that aside for now, there's another issue about this, which is that um, um, This person comes to me and says, I'm telling you to do this because this is your will. But like, I know what my will is now, <laughs> right? I mean, really, you know, like they can tell me whatever they want, but I, I, I'm gonna still do my deliberation and there's gonna be a desire or aversion at the end. Um, in other words, the, the question is, um, As usual, how can I lay, lay down a right? So making someone my agent was laying down a right. But uh, if I tried to do that in a state of nature, it basically wouldn't work. The right would come back. <laughs> that is because, so I mean, This is like a general issue about Hobbes. Um, and it's connected to things I've been saying about him before, about the essence of what he's doing being to give new definitions of things or careful definition of things that makes it sound like you're saying one thing, but it turns out you're actually saying something else, basically. Right? So like um to talk about things in terms of rights and transferring rights and laying down rights and whatever is like obscures what's really going on according to Hobbes. Like you might ask, why can't I lay down my right in the state of nature? You know, like I have an acorn I can lay down. Why can't I lay down a right? And then you have to remember that laying down a right means that a right just means the liberty to do or forbear. Laying down a right means making it such that I no longer have liberty to do or forbear. And in the state of nature, I have no way of doing it. So I can say, you're my agent to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and, uh, and I can say, that means I'm laying down my right to second guess you. But I didn't really lay it down. There's no impediment. Or, you know, that is to take the whole rights thing out of it, right? It's just like, you know, I can say, um, you decide for me, but if I don't like the way you decided, no one's going to make me <laughs> go with what you decide. There's no one there to make me. So I'm really just going to go with what I decide. So, um, so my authorization to the person who's issuing the command in my name isn't going to work unless, as you can see from that example of the state of nature, unless the person who is issuing the command in my name actually has the power to make that my will. Right, so, so, you know, now they say, do this because it's your will. And I say, no, that's not my will. And they say, and they take their club and they say, think again, what's your will? <laughs> right, like that's basically the way this works. <laughs> so, um, 
So, right, that is, um, um, so for command to work, there must be reliable punishment for breaking. That's what's going to make it actually my will. And that's actually how it works in a commonwealth, according to Marx. Right? So, like every time the sovereign, whether it's an assembly or a monarch or whatever, makes a law, um, um, they say, This is now your will. And I say, No, that's not my will. I want to go 90 miles an hour. And they say, um, well, maybe that's a bad example because that law isn't very well enforced. But uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but still, right? So they say, well, think again. If you go ninety miles an hour, we're going to take the driver away. You know, whatever. So I say, oh, I guess it's not my will. <laughs> um. And I mean, of course, it's not like the guy with the club. So the guy with the club, you know, won't really work because at least in the state of nature, I'm going to think, hmm, but maybe I'm strong enough to defeat. But in a commonwealth, if it's set up properly and the people are educated properly and so forth, it is going to work because everyone else is going to look at my situation and say, well, you know, um, uh, yeah, if I were him, I might want to go 90 miles an hour. But I'm not him, and I'm wondering, like, like, you know, would it be a good idea to start a civil war and be back in the state of nature? <laughs> and I say to myself, no, I don't want to. And so when the sovereign says punish this guy because he was driving too fast, so I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so that's what makes the threat reliable. So therefore, even though law doesn't involve punishment by definition, there can't really be a law that is um, a command to someone who's formally obliged to obey without threat of punishment or a promise of rewards, but he doesn't talk about that very much. And of course, as a matter of fact, we don't use that very much to enforce law. <laughs> um, why that is. Uh, I don't think he discussed it. Locke might have something to say. But anyway, um, right, because you could imagine instead of a club that the guy says, do this. And I say, because it's your will. And I say, well, that's not my will. And they say, well, I gave you a cupcake. Now what's your will? <laughs> right? I mean, that does work sometimes with paternal dominion, <laughs> uh, such as it is. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, but we don't usually like try to enforce laws that way. Um, okay, in any case, um, so that, that like finishes what I have to say about the connection between law and punishment. The other thing um, I wanted to discuss about law is uh, that, or about this definition of law is that there's nothing about it that implies either universality or stability. So the law as, as right, so the law is a, com a command issued to someone by someone else um, whom they are uh, obliged to obey. Um, 
And it's clear from that definition that there could be as many laws as there are subjects. There could be as many laws as there are occasions for the sovereign to give a command. And in fact, in chapter 26, paragraph three, Which considered, I define civil law in this manner. Civil law is to every subject those rules which the commonwealth have commanded, have commanded him by word, writing, or other sufficient sign of the will to make use of for the distinction of right and wrong. So, um, and Hobbes goes on to say, yeah, there can be laws that apply to everyone, right? Where the sovereign gives a command to everyone in general. There can be laws that apply to certain types of people and there can be laws for individuals. And the laws can change. In fact, well, I mean, first, we know laws can change somehow, but the laws can change every time the sovereign gives a command. Now, I mean, if the sovereign is assembly, that involves, of course, a certain process, but uh, just it's only just majority vote is the process, right? Um, if the sovereign is a monarch, then it's just like whatever the monarch feels like to him. So, um, right, and it's actually from that that um, Hobbes proves, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other ways you could prove this. I think this isn't the most fundamental way. I think I've already proved it. I mean, just by saying that the sovereign is not a party to the, co to the, to the covenant that starts the commonwealth. But nevertheless, he has, he has a proof here that the sovereign um, is not subject to the civil laws. This is um, chapter 26, paragraph 6 on page 174. For having power to make and repeal laws, he may, when he pleaseth, free himself from that subjection by repealing those laws that trouble him and making of new. And consequently, he was free before. Right? So he's saying there can't be a law, a civil law that applies to the sovereign because the sovereign makes the civil laws. So, you know, let's say the sovereign made a law that you can't, like, uh, just uh, walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot someone, but then they, you know, the sovereign is a monarch, and one day he feels like doing that. So just say, uh, today the law for me is you can do that, <laughs> right? And because, like, the sovereign can, you know, and it's it's the same for a sovereign assembly, right? I mean, in a way, it's even clearer in the case of a sovereign assembly. Right, like he gives the case of the Athenians having forbidden themselves to, to uh, discuss the invasion of the island of Salamis. So, um, um, you know, like obviously, if they voted to make that law in the first place, they could vote to remove it too, which is what they eventually did. Right. So, um, um, but uh, um, I think the point is that at least from if we don't take into account the law of nature, at least. Um, there's like no drag on this. There's no reason for the sovereign not to change the law every time they feel like it. Um, which means that um, Hobbes is not a conservative in some sense, a conservative. 
right? He doesn't believe in precedent or tradition or anything like that as a reason for doing anything. Um, except for the fundamental law of the Commonwealth that says who the sovereign is. <laughs> Um, well, although even that, the sovereign can change. Yeah, it's just no one else. Can. So, um, yeah, so maybe I shouldn't even make that exception. Um, um, right, so like this is pair. Uh, paragraph seven in that same chapter, right after what I was just reading on page 174. If the sovereign shall have a question of right grounded not upon his present will, but upon the laws formerly made. So um, this is some, a distinction that Hobbes made before. He says the sovereign, like, so the sovereign can just come take my property and say it's for the good of the common. But sometimes, and he's not saying why, but I guess you could think of reasons. The sovereign, well, I mean, I guess the main reason is this. The sovereign doesn't want to have to constantly be going around to everyone and deciding what they want to take from them for the good of the commonwealth. They want to do it by general rule, right? Like they want to have tax laws so that they can appoint agents to go collect the tax uh, rate. So, um, so like a lot of times the sovereign will be claiming something that's mine property, my property based on a already existing law, not based on saying this is my will. And again, this is like if it doesn't, it doesn't maybe doesn't make sense if you imagine the sovereign, the monarch or the assembly themselves kind of showing up at the door and saying, I want your stuff based on this law. Right, why not just take it? But the point is, like most of the time, that's not how it's happening. So it's, you know, like the tax collector shows up at my door and says, the sovereign, based on law X, Y, and Z, authorizes me to take your whatever. So when that happens, Hobbes says it's, you know, if there's a dispute about it, it will be decided by the courts, just like a dispute between subjects. I mean, that does mean that, you know, since the power of judicature is in the sovereign, ultimately, that if the court decides against the sovereign, they could always overrule. Uh, but again, normally they won't, right? Like, even if, the, you know, if the president of the United States was an absolute monarch, they would still let the IRS courts decide tax disputes most of the time. It wouldn't be like, uh, oh no, let me see. No, I would like that one. <laughs> so, um, all right, so that's the context of this. If the sovereign shall have a question of right grounded not upon his present will, but upon laws formerly made, the length of time shall bring no prejudice to his right, but the question shall be judged by equity. For many unjust actions and unjust sentences go uncontrolled a longer time than any man can remember. Right, so what's happening here is something like the sovereign makes a claim against me by, due to a previously existing law. And I say, well, but look at all this case law in the past. It's always been decided that this is a deductible expense, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, but the sovereign or the judge who's representing the sovereign looks at the law and judges inequity that that shouldn't be a deductible expense. So, right, Hobbes says all that case law is irrelevant. Precedent is irrelevant. For many unjust actions and unjust sentences go uncontrolled a longer time than any man can remember. 
And our lawyers account no custom law, but such as are reasonable, and that evil customs are to be abolished. But the judgment of what is reasonable and of what is to be abolished belongeth to him that maketh the law, which is the sovereign assembly or monarch. Right, so he's, you know, so he's saying, like, if you say, wait, isn't it a principle of law that customs shouldn't be changed? He says, well, unless they're unreasonable customs. <laughs> so, so far it sounds like, okay, yeah, for the most part, they won't be changed. But then he adds, and who's gonna decide if they're unreasonable? The sovereign, right? So, or the sovereign's agent, the judge. Um, so, you know, and similarly, he says right after that in paragraph nine, page 175, the legislator is he, not by whose authority the laws were first made, but by whose authority they now continue to be laws, right? So in effect, like, um, when the same law continues for year after year, this is something like what Descartes and a lot of other people say about, about the existence of the universe, that it's recreated at every instant. Because <laughs> it doesn't have any power in itself to continue until the next instant. Um, that's the same thing Hobbes is saying about laws. Like if the sovereign made a law yesterday, it's not, and it's still a law now. It's only a law now because the sovereign now still wills it to be a law, which they give a sign of by not saying it's not a law, right? <laughs> but still, it's uh, right. So not so. If nothing happens, it will remain in force. But that's not because of some power it had in itself. That's because of the current will of the sovereign. Um, so, you know, just as that view of the existence of the universe means that uh, um, God can annihilate the universe at any time just by withdrawing the consent, basically. <laughs> this means that the sovereign can abolish the law at any time just by changing their mind about it. And as you saw from that other quote, that's not necessarily a bad idea because a lot of times the way the law was, the way the law was or the way the law was judged in the past was, um, was wrong. So why keep consenting to it? Um, and in fact, uh, so so I was saying that this means that Hobbes is not a conservative. In, so I mean that's true in principle, but like you can see in practice that he's actually a radical. Um, that he thinks that this occasion where the existing laws and practices are bad not only can come up, but basically does come up all the time. Um, Right, so this is chapter 20, paragraph 19 on page 135. The greatest objection is that of the practice. When men asked where and when such power has by subjects been acknowledged. Right, so this is where he's, you know, um, He's, he's just finished proving both from reason and from scripture that, uh, that sovereign power should be absolute. Proving it from scripture is really hard because <laughs> it certainly, you know, like the forms of government described there all seem divided and limited. But, but you know, he makes his case and then, you know, but now he's dealing with objections. And he says, the greatest objection is that of the practice. When men ask, where and when such power has by subjects been acknowledged? Right? People say, look, people have never acknowledged that their rulers have absolute power with no limits. And his response is, 
But one may ask them again, when or where has there been a kingdom long free from sedition and civil war? Meaning, you're right that this doctrine has not been acknowledged, at least not around here, right? In the next sentence, he goes on to talk about long-lived uh, commonwealths where it has been acknowledged, meaning, you know, like um, what other people disparagingly would call oriental despotism. But from, again, from Hobbes' point of view, it's the West that has the wrong institutions. <laughs> so for him, it's like, whether it's true or not. And like, you know, I imagined him at the last time I was imagining him at a kind of like current events panel discussion in Istanbul. The truth is the Ottoman Empire was not like super, although the power of the uh, Sultan was, you know, in theory, absolute. The, uh, uh, it wasn't very stable or free of violence. <laughs> but anyway, never mind that. So, um, so but he's saying, so at least around, around here, you're right, this power never has been acknowledged. And that's why we keep having civil wars and sedition. <laughs> so that, so um, um, it's never been acknowledged before, but it better be acknowledged now. <laughs> um, and if you ask, well, hold on a second. If he's not a conservative, why is he so attached to this old institution of absolute monarchy by divine right? The answer, more or less, I mean, it's a little more complicated than this, but basically the answer is, it's not an old institution. It's just being invented <laughs> in the 17th century. Absolute monarchy by divine right. The old institutions are the ones that Hobbes is, fighting, Hobbes is fighting against, right? So the old institutions were, for example, like all the ancient and um, uh, medieval people who write about the different forms of government come down on the side of mixed government as the best. Um, you know, there's the Senate and the people of Rome, right? That's a traditional institution. And as for monarchy, well, the traditional institutions are feudalism, right? So feudalism is not absolute monarchy. It means that like the monarch has, you know, has rules different territories in different ways because the lords of those territories have, you know, owe fealty. <laughs> um, uh, and, all kinds of complicated things arise under feudalism for that reason. That, like, you know, you can be William can be the king of England, but meanwhile, William can be the Duke of Normandy, <laughs> and as Duke of Normandy, William can be responsible to someone else. <laughs> um, so, you know. That's, a, that's the traditional institution of monarchy, um, or that's part of the traditional institution of monarchy. That's, you know, obviously, according to Hobbes, that's absurd. Um, similarly, elective monarchy is a traditional institution in, in, in Europe, right? Like the Holy Roman Emperor is elected, not, of course, by popular vote, but by the electors. The electors are like princes. <laughs> um, so, uh, and parliaments, right? So, you know, Hobbes cites this doctrine that the common law hath no controller but the parliament. That's a traditional doctrine of, of English common law. The king can't change the common law, only the, only the parliament. That's the traditional view, but Hobbes is fighting against it. And similarly, I guess, I mean, I could go on, but this, this is probably the most important example. The traditional institution is division between secular power and spiritual power, um, which again, Hobbes thinks is absurd and dangerous. 
So, like, he compares all these traditional doctrines to like diseases in the body of the child. He says the traditional doctrine of the law of England that says that, you know, the, the powers of sovereignty are divided between the king and the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Because I don't know what, what disease to compare this to, except I once saw a man with another man growing out of his son. And then he says if he had had another one growing out of his other side, I think you know, that would be an exact comparison. So it's like, I mean, is that so bad? Well, um, this one he said had its own stomach. <laughs> I don't believe he actually saw that, but I mean, why did he make it up? I don't know. Anyway, um, is that so bad? Well, it probably would make it hard to do something, you know. Uh, like, you know, I would say, well, let's go to this restaurant because I want to eat stuff and get it in my stomach. And you would say, no, I don't like that restaurant. But, I mean, just as soon as you were growing out of my side, and you would say, no, let's go to this other restaurant. And eventually we would start like tearing each other's hair out or something. I <laughs> guess that's what he's thinking. I don't know. Anyway, um, so um, um, and more. So so all of the all of the traditional conservative institutions of Europe are actually Hobbes is fighting against this in the name of a radical new doctrine. I mean, it's just. Like, um, it doesn't fit our idea of a radical revolutionary doctrine because it, because we think that, you know, we imagine that being kind of uh, left, right? <laughs> but his is about absolute power of the sovereign. Um, so, and, you know, um, I guess one final thing is that he doesn't also, he doesn't claim that these traditional institutions are corruptions of the original pure institutions. You know, I mean, because that's a way that you can kind of be like, like what Martin Luther did, right? Where you can kind of be uh, both conservative and radical. You say, um, everything has to change because it's all drifted away from its proper original state. But Hobbes, you know, in explaining why our commonwealths are the way they are, this is chapter 29, paragraph three, on page 211. Um, Talking about the cause of infirmities of the commonwealth, he says, of which this is one, that a man to obtain a kingdom is sometimes content with less power than to the peace and defense of the commonwealth is necessarily required. And then he mentions that this is indeed what William the Conqueror did when he set up the kingdom of England. I mean, at least the current version of it. <laughs> um, that William the Conqueror uh, wanted to make himself king of England, but uh, he, uh, you know, uh, I guess wasn't strong enough to do it all by himself. And so to make it easier, he swore an oath not to uh, interfere with the liberties of the church. And then it says that his uh, son, William Rufus, made further concessions to the barons. Um, that, that is to the, to the Norman nobility um, that further weakened the crown of England. And that was the beginning of the problem. So it's never been like that before. But now, due to the progress of science, lots of Right, new discoveries are made every day. And I, maybe I should read this too. 
we come for spirit with divine water. Um, time and industry produce everyday new knowledge. And as the art of well building is derived from principles of reason observed by industrious men that have long studied the nature of materials um, and the diverse effects of figure and proportion, long after mankind began, though poorly, to build. So long time after men have begun to constitute commonwealths, imperfect and apt to relapse into disorder, they may, there may principles of reason be found out by industrious meditation to make their constitution, except by external violence, everlasting. Right, so he's saying like, just like it's not that houses were first built really well, and then due to like corruption, they started building them worse. And now we have to go back to the original way of building houses. Houses were originally built poorly, but then, like after a lot of experience of building houses and seeing them fall down, people started to figure out what the right way to build them was until finally they were able to build buildings that would last as long as the material. So he says, you know, similarly, uh, yeah, from the beginning of time, people have made a commonwealth the wrong way. <laughs> um, but, you know, after all this time, it's a little bit, it doesn't really want to claim it's by experience in this case. It's just principles of reason have been discovered. I guess that's why he says industrious meditation <laughs> in this case, whereas in the case of building, he says, he just says industrious. Right? But but still, it's due to, to experience in the sense that we've experienced over and over that things don't work out. And so that's the motive to sit down and figure it out. And that's what he's done. And so now in the name of this new, um, newly discovered rational doctrine um, is the time to build our commonwealth's belong. Um, And if you ask, well, who gave you the right to tell us how to build our commonwealth? Hobbes so says, I don't have the right. This is just counsel. But hopefully a sovereign will read this book. <laughs> now he must be thinking about a monk. Let's see. Uh, hopefully a sovereign will read this book. And a sovereign will, will open their eyes. Oh, I see. I have absolute power. And that's how it will work. All right, so that's the end of my discussion of law. Um, are there questions about that? Um, yes. Um, is this like when he's talking about like laws of nature versus the law of like the English administration, I guess, because I'm thinking when he's saying that. So there should be, if it works correctly, it should produce peace. Um, you know, and there's like, so, I mean, I guess there's two parts to that. One part is the sovereign's duty to set up punishments, and they have to be like proportionate punishments, right? So they have to be like, because remember, but like by the definition of punishment, it has to be to the end that people should ob should obey the law. So um, it's going to be enough to serve as a deterrent. And presumably not more, although he doesn't emphasize that. But I think it falls from some of the laws of nature that it shouldn't be more. Um, 
So that's one part of it. And the other part of it is education. Right? People are supposed to be taught to understand why they should avail it. Um, that's supposed to produce peace. Uh, um, now it's true, and maybe this is what you're asking. And that's why I want to get to discussing this. I think briefly. Uh, a very long time that, um, you know, suppose the sovereign just decides to go around, uh, you know, like, um, well, so, we know examples like this, right? Suppose the sovereign's agents take to pulling people over because they have a broken tail light and like shooting, <laughs> you know? So uh, do the subjects have a right to complain? Well, no, according to the courts. They don't have a right to complain because they authorize the sovereign to do this. But, of course, and I, this is the same thing I was saying last time, if the sovereign goes around doing stuff like that, they're undermining the basis of peace. Right? That is, if people start feeling that they're going to be um, that evil is going to be inflicted on them by the sovereign without any respect to whether they've broken the law or not. Then their incentive to obey the law goes away. Um, so it's in, so although no one is going to, no one can under the civil law punish the sovereign for doing stuff like that. A natural consequence of the sovereign doing stuff like that is breaches of the peace. And eventually, if it's bad enough, rebellion, civil war, the dissolution of the Commonwealth. Right? So, so, so somehow that's connected with this thing about the sovereign not being answerable to the civil law, but being answerable to the law of nature. So, yes, the, so the sovereign has the full right of nature to go around hurting anyone. Um, but, uh, but the sovereign should think twice <laughs> about how to use that. Um, so, um, right. So, I mean, so how do the laws of nature, how do the laws of nature fit the definition of law that I gave before. So, of course, the short answer is that Hobbes says they don't fit that definition, right? He said this a long time ago before he even gave the definition uh, in chapter 25, paragraph 41 on page 100. These dictates of reason men use to call Right, use to call means like as we would say they usually call. It's yeah, I mean we use use this way only in the past tense, right? Like they used to call, but they use they used to use it in the present tense too. They used to call. So these these decades of reason men used to call by the names the name of laws, but improperly, for they are but conclusions or theorems concerning what conducive to the conservation and defense of themselves. Whereas law properly is the word of him that by right hath command over others. So actually he is giving a definition there basically in advance, short form of it. But then he adds, but yet if we consider the same theorems as delivered in the word of God, that by right commandeth all things, then are they properly called law. So what he's saying there at the end, you know, chapter 15 is the list of the laws of nature, right? So after he finishes listing all the laws of nature, he says, oh, well, they're not really laws, actually. They're just theorems of reason. That is, they're just good advice. Basically. 
But then he adds, oh, but if you consider them as the word of God, then they really are laws. So the question is, what does that mean? And this is, you know, we're going into a lot soon. And this is important because in Locke, it's going to mean something apparently um, much more substantial than what it means in Hobbes. It's also complicated. Anyway, we'll talk about it when we get to Locke. But so, what does it mean that um, God by right commandeth all things? So, it should mean that if I know, so like, if I have a right to command certain to command you to do certain things, again, that means that my will gives you a reason to uh, act in a certain way. That is, that you have a reason to act in accordance with my will. So this should mean that if I know God's will, that gives me a reason to act in accordance. With that's what it should mean to say that we consider the laws of nature as um, um, God's commands, who has the right to command all things. But the problem is, what is God's will? So, like, a will, again, is supposed to be the final desire or aversion or deliberation. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then I end up with, with this aversion, and so that's my will. And that's where I stop the little bit. Um, now, so can we say that, that God has desires and aversions according to Hobbes? Well, so in a sense, we can't say anything about God according to Hobbes, right? Remember, Hobbes said all our um, concepts are a finite thing. We can form no notion or idea, or I forget exactly what we're used to, of anything that's not finite. Um, but on the other hand, like that tells us the one thing we do know about God, so to speak, it's a negative thing, that God is not finite. Um, and desire and aversion are certainly characters of finite beings. Right? Like to desire something means that there's something that you don't have but you want. I mean, there's this, you know, like the way that works in us, according to Hobbes, is there's a small motion that starts inside the ear and it has the potential to be amplified into my getting the thing. But, uh, but you know, there only are these motions in me because there are things that I don't have. But, yeah. Well, does God even reach the end of like a deliberative process? Like, if you back and forth and back and forth with the universal being, is that? Well, I'm saying it's worse than that because, because these individual things are desires and aversions. And an infinite being wouldn't have desires. Um, and sure enough, when Hobbes talks about the divine will, so this is chapter 31, paragraph 26 on page 240. He says, um, And therefore, when we ascribe to God a will, it is not to be understood as that of man for our rational appetite, but as the power by which he effecteth everything. So rational appetite, you know, so like when Aristotelians define will as a rational appetite, they mean it's an appetite that's accountable to reason. Right, there's like a standard that's different from my appetites that I compare my appetites to. But Hobbes already went through this all and said that the sense in which the will is a rational appetite is just this. It's an appetite that's the result of deliberation. Right, so he's saying, but when we talk of God's will, we can't mean that. 
Rather, it's the power by which he affecteth everything. So when we say God wills a certain thing, we just mean that uh, well, we, we really just mean that that thing happens. And like everything, it happens by God's infinite power. Whatever that means. It's incomprehensible. <laughs> whatever that means. And so, um, and so the reason to obey God's will um is um, um I put it this a certain way in my notes, but I'm not sure I think it's the right way to say it. What I was gonna say is God's right to command, yeah, maybe this is the right way to say it. God's right to command is nothing but God's absolute power to reward and punish. It's just, um, it just means that if something bad happens to me when I do something, that's because of God's infinite power. <laughs> if something good happens to me when I do something, that was because of God's infinite power. So, um, so I want to act in accordance with God's will just means I want to act in such a way that bad things don't happen to me and good things do happen to me. By virtue of God's infinite power. But everything happens, but right, it's God's power which affects everything. <laughs> so, um, um, so yeah, so maybe uh, maybe this wasn't the right. God's right to command. I said it's got nothing but God's absolute power to reward and punish. But a better way to put it would be God's quote unquote right to command is nothing but God's absolute power. What does it mean that God has the right to punish? Well, like what are divine punishments? So, um, well, this is what Hobbes says right around the same place I was just reading. Um, chapter 31, paragraph 40 on page 243. Foreseeing punishments are consequent to the breach of laws. Natural punishments must be naturally consequent to the breach of the laws of nature. And therefore, follow them as their natural, not arbitrary effects. Um, so, in other words, I'm not explaining this in exactly the right order. But in other words, when we say God commands something, we don't mean I mean, we mean that it's God's will that I do it. But when we say it's God's will, we don't mean God decided that I should do it. We mean God's power makes it the case that I should do it. How does God's power make it the case that I should do it? Well, if it's something that will have these bad consequences for me, Um, that I can foresee will have bad consequences for me, then I can describe that by saying, God is going to punish me if I do it. So, in other words, this whole, like, detour through the divine will and so forth doesn't really add any reason to obey the laws of nature. Right? It's um, our reason for obeying the laws of nature, if we have a reason to obey them, is the same as it was before, right? namely that they're good advice. 
the only thing we add by saying that they're divine laws is, oh yeah, and everything is the effect of God's incomprehensible infinite power. Right, so like before I said, you know, uh, you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z because it will lead to the dissolution of the Commonwealth or, you know, uh, or it won't lead to peace. Um, now I say, you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z because, um, given the way God made the world, won't lead to peace. <laughs> but, you know, that extra part about, like, given the way God made the world doesn't add anything. Like, that is, you only know that, in other words, you, that you only know, and after all, this is what a law of nature has to be like. Right? A law of nature has to be something that people can figure out anywhere at any time. They can't need a prophet to tell them or something like that. So, you know, so that it's a law of nature really just means that, it, or sorry, that it's a divine commandment really just means that I can figure out using my reason that I should do it. So when we said, you know, but regarding them as divine laws, they really are laws. It's, it's a trick. <laughs> it's like, when we regard them as divine laws, as proceeding from God's will, then we can make them fit the definition of law, but only because we've changed the definition of will. <laughs> right? As he said, when we... When we speak of the divine will, we're not talking about the same thing. We're only talking about God's infinite power. So, uh, so the way looking at them as divine laws makes them really laws is by slipping in a different definition of will. So it's really, it's like an improper way of speaking, basically. Um, Oops, I'm out of time. I'm going to have to. So I want to ask the question, why speak in this improper way? <laughs> but I'm always going to have to do that next time because I'm out. Uh, and I will see you then. <laughs>